Okay, so before I dive into the topic itself, uh, maybe shortly I would like to introduce myself uh, for those who don't know me. Uh, even though I see a lot of familiar faces uh, here, for which I'm super glad. Um, I have uh, a span of around 10 years of experience uh, in UX, but I started as I would suppose many uh, fellow UX colleagues started, and that's from the graphic uh, field of industry, graphic design. Um, what is interesting maybe to mention is that I have a bachelor degree in psychology, and for me it was really interesting over the years to kind of find the perfect blend between these two professions, for which I can gladly say that in the past maybe two to three years that I finally found the balance or kind of I'm working the thing which is like mostly of, uh, conducting from both uh, professions, um, mostly in research, of course, in UX research. Um, what I will be talking about uh, in this talk of uh, just enough research is the motivation that I had uh, behind this talk. Uh, to be honest, like there is a book actually, which is called Just Enough Research from Erika Hall. But to be honest, I haven't really read that. Uh, I started reading it uh, early September on vacation, but I already applied with the name of this talk because um, the, the title just uh, uh, was stuck with me because uh, I will talk about why actually later on. Uh, but it's really around how to get to the feeling of doing enough when it comes to UX research. Um, then I will talk a bit uh, about the mental models of people and how you can create buy-ins, better buy-ins with uh, wor workshops and uh, as a research method. But I thought maybe it's good to set the boundaries. So I also wanted to, to mention what I will not be covering in this talk. And that's not how to actually do research in processes. I wouldn't uh, talk, I, I won't be talking about perfect formula for doing uh, research, nor specific research methods, nor focusing on user research and UX research solely as such. So I still hope that it will be interesting enough for you. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, before we start, I want to emphasize that there are millions of ways of how you can do UX research and research in general. And doing research is always better because you gain experience but there is no perfect formula for enough when it comes to enough, like when to stop or how to design your research so you can actually get to the point of solving the problem uh, in the beginning. So what I will be talking about is solely from my experience and what I think is very crucial of how you can get uh, there to the point of enough. And I'll start by saying more or less something about the sound of research as such. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, how it sounds, you know, because at times it sounds that it's complex or it can sound that it's a, a bit ambiguous or serious, that it kind of, you know, creates this uh, pressure of what are the expectations out of the research itself. That's why there, there are like many uh, ways of how to do it. But what, what it is actually, it's simply an inquiry of information to solve the problem that you are starting with. But of course, there is a complicated side to, to it, and that's uh, because it's still a systematic approach uh, that you use of critical thinking to understand and solve the problems, including tools, methodologies, and activities that uh, the, society, the, the community have provided as such, as useful. But like for me, um, the challenge over the years was uh, kind of to create this balance between how simply you can do a research, UX research, and how complicated it can get. And in developing that balance, I actually got to understanding that uh, ultimately what I will be talking about in this talk, and that's your gut feeling. So no perfect formula for it, no written anything, is just a gut feeling and I will be talking about how you can develop your gut feeling or how to get to the point that will uh, clearly uh, work as a hint so you can actually stop doing in, uh, research. But before I get to the gut feeling, it's really important to, to point out the base uh, of doing good research because good research is ultimately a base for enough research. And that's knowing the problem. I want to mention this because Sometimes if you're not solving the right problem, 
your whole research can go into, into the gar garbage can. So it's really important to know the problem and set the right research question that I want to, uh, to answer with that uh, research. And we always start with, uh, start with, a, uh, with a problem and it can be like answering all or some of these questions. You want to find out what happens, explain, uh, or how things happen. You want to put them into context or you want to understand why these things happen, like find some correlations between the things and topics that came out of it. Um, but when it gets interesting, that's the dimensions. I call them dimensions. It can be qualities, like perspectives of the problem. Uh, and this is, where it, 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 this is where the interesting thing is, like you need to understand the dimensions of the problem that you are solving. And there are like two distinguished dimensions. That's the clearness of the problem and the quantity of information, which I think are very important. Like the clearness of the problem. If the problem that you are solving is very complex, broad, uh, probably you will need more time until you get to a point where you actually understand what you need to solve. Um, the quantity of information goes in hand with the clearness. I will explain how. But if you start with you want to research something, for example, tackle some UX problem, for example, or some um, happening like uh, behavior. Uh, and then you don't have any information about that particular case, for example. There is no secondary research available. There is nothing if you Google it. So probably you will need uh, some time until you get to the sufficient amount of information that can actually help you clear out the problem. So they somehow go like this, hand in hand, like, as, as you inquire much and mu uh, more and more information, that's how you clear out the problem more. And then let me just show you graphically how that these two dimensions work. So we always start with a problem, right? It's messy. You start with assuming something, roughly, and then you start researching. You get insights around it. And then these dotted lines start to appear suddenly it looks like a circle, more or less. And then you gain more clearness and the circle becomes more evident. But as you start building the blocks of knowledge, what actually happens is that the area of the problem expands beneath or beyond the initial idea that you had. And then you start seeing shapes. You start uh, seeing these patterns that start to emerge. And this is where actually your brain starts to autocomplete. So you have gathered a lot of data and now you start to, to make sense out of it. And actually, there are like patterns starting to emerging. And you figure it out, oh, wait, it's not actually a circle, it's actually a triangle. And this is where you stop. So this is the first point where you stop. When you start to see patterns in your data of what you have gathered as insight, like whether that's from stakeholders interviews, user interviews, or in general. And why it's important to, know, to mention this, like in the case that you have a complex research, for example, and no patterns start to emerge, but you feel that so far they should have emerged, probably you should uh, go a step backwards to your research design and ask yourself whether your research design is actually leading you to the insight that you need. For example, I will tell you an example. We were having these stakeholder interviews with eight interviewees. And up until the third uh, interview with the third one, we didn't see any patterns emerging. It was even more scarce, the data that we got. And so we said something is feeling off. That's when you, <laughs> when you have the first, uh, first hint of your gut feeling, telling you that something is off. And then what we did actually is we redesigned the we rewrote actually the questions. And after the fourth interview, everything was more clear, patterns started to emerge and everything made more sense. And in the case that uh, the problem is not in the research uh, design, so in the format of how you do the research, then you go even step f uh, backwards and then uh, that's the problem. That's why I mentioned in the beginning, it's really important to know what problem you're solving because if you have if you are further away in the research and you're actually solving something which is not resonating with the initial problem, then you really have a problem. Um, the second hint or kind of a touch point that you can use into developing this gut feeling is to stop midway. So actually you will, you will sense that 
these are uh, kind of also helpers that can help you to evaluate if you have done enough research so you can actually stop. Stopping midway and zooming out actually goes into a different perspective where you ask yourself whether what you have as a data, acquired data, uh, can, whether you can, can, uh, can make sense out of it. So again, it's complex, you're making, uh, like you're doing research and at, at some point, if you don't make sense out of it, you should ask yourself again, the two previous questions that I mentioned, whether your research design is correct, whether you're solving the right, the right problem, and if that's the, like positively yes, then probably you are in a different stage of your design, uh, of your research, and probably you need to investigate a bit further more until you get what you need. And then the third one, the most interesting one, is to trust your mental map and your mental model. Why? Because ultimately, you are the one who have been uh, through the research from the beginning. You are the one who have all the data in your head. And of course, there will always be some bias, but the point is to reduce uncertainty. You will never be uh, fully sure that you have not included some bias. But the point is that, and this is uh, like very tricky for me because uh, at some points, I can tell you from my personal experience, I was so into reducing the bias that I would even include more and more research methods just to confirm that I'm not including any whatsoever bias into what I'm researching. Of course, that's budget and money, right? And that's <laughs> when you need to stop. Like you really need to start uh, trusting your mental map because you have all the data in your mind already. What helps here also is to have a fellow colleague who works with you, so with whom you can actually validate if you're not creating too much bias into the insights. Okay, so that's for me the gut feeling or how you can get to that developing that gut feeling more or less. So emerging patterns, at some point you will need to start believing uh, that uh, to believe the, the emergence of patterns that happens. Uh, st try to stop midway and take the other perspective for zooming out and try to understand if you can work with the data as such and just proceed. Uh, and then trust your mental map. But when enough is enough, and that's when I go back to the f initial dimensions that I mentioned, and that's when you gain clearness, some clearness of the problem that we want to solve, and when we have sufficient information to start solving. And that's when we actually proceed. And here I want to mention uh, a practical example. Um, you can find the whole uh, Medium article that I wrote, uh, wrote in this, uh, on this topic. Uh, at some point, I was working for a product who was... Um, the product was around complex um, collaboration processes between different personas. So apparently it had a timeline. It included document uh, collaboration on complex documents. And uh, what happened is that at some point we wanted to uh, enhance the the collaboration and of course like and kind of enhance the what uh, all the personas get as insights what they need to do for example in order to proceed that collaboration process and the initial thing was okay let's build a dashboard and what we said like okay let's stop and our problem actually that we wanted to solve to to, to find out was is dashboard is uh, like the dashboard solving the issue and we got to a point where we said, okay, the dashboard is not the solution. And that's the first uh, place where we stopped because we validated that the problem, uh, the solution is not the dashboard. And then in the next phase, actually, we found out, and that's actually where you continue with the research because you need more data what to do or how to, do, how to solve the problem, the initial problem that you had. And then uh, we got to a solution, actually, uh, where it was more about enhancing the existing views or offering more clear guidance to different personas what they are expected to do in each of these collaboration processes that were happening on a document exchange level. Okay. Um, back to the gut feeling. Um, so, because of, of course I, I talked a bit uh, bits of uh, here and there uh, and why I think it's important to develop your gut feeling 
And that's because there is no data that will ever, ever tell you when to stop. And that should be kind of your mantra <laughs> that will give you like the courage to, to implement all of these hints, uh, uh, the emerging patterns, the stopping midway and trusting your mental map and your power as a researcher, as a UX researcher. Um, and then uh, I want to talk a bit more about how we can develop this uh, gut feeling, but together with stakeholders, so we can actually create a better buy-in. And that's, of course, with workshops. Uh, with workshops being so popularized over the past uh, few years, especially if you add like design thinking and then a workshop, it's a win-win. Um, so why it's, it's good uh, to have like a workshop as a research method. Workshop is actually a research method and you can design the workshop in a way that you can actually get to valuable insights in the end. And it's always good if you do them with stakeholders because if you include like stakeholders from the beginning in such a setup, you're really demystifying research because they're doing it and they see that it's not something abstract, that it just, uh, you go through it and you see the immediate value out of it. And also like, while doing the things together with, uh, with uh, stakeholders, uh, you actually share the responsibility in creating this gut feeling in the end, and you even become more powerful as a team to decide how to proceed with those insights after the workshop. And the ultimate buy-in, so these are just more or less random things that I wanted to mention, but I find really crucial, like you really need to mind your words when it comes to buying and with whom you're talking. I will get there in a moment. Um, so I was in a, I was doing this pitch deck at a C-level position. There were like 10 people and uh, we were asking for a budget for a research project projects uh, to last uh, around six months. Um, and we got three months, nevertheless, uh, like I was during, during the pitch deck, I was always doing this research, 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 research. And then one of the guys stopped me and he said, Okay, so what you're trying to do actually is validate through research. And I said, whoa, yes, I want to validate through research. <laughs> and he, of course, that was the buy-in. They still didn't give me six months. It was free, but still <laughs> it was worth it. And then I actually tried to, to, when I talked about research, I was never just using research. I was also using innovation for research. I don't know, explanation, understanding what you want to achieve and things like that. Also, what has proven uh, very beneficial, especially if you're working in a corporate culture, a very big one, as I work in, um, it's always good if you can find your ambassadors. I call them ambassadors. Those are, like, those are like the people who actually value research, but they don't really do it, but you can like do it with them or you can just enable them or empower them to do research. And that's when I get, get to the point of people who do research, that's actual term. Uh, very popular, especially in the last two years from in the research ops community. And those are people who actually want to do research, but are not sure how to do it. So actually what you do is enable them to do research and actually becomes part of the culture itself that everyone can do research. You just offer the right tools and means they can still consult you how to do it. But ultimately that should create the buy-in because that's how the idea about it spreads around. Okay, so um, maybe to sum it up, um, it's not about uh, knowing uh, all the tools and methodologies. It's not like uh, the experience, of course, is very valuable uh, in terms of years of how much years or time you have spent on doing research, but it's really sometimes about uh, stopping somewhere, knowing when to stop, trusting your mental map that you can actually get sense out of the data because you're doing the research, you're the, you are the researcher, you're the, the most powerful tool to do it. And then of course, when you start uh, to see patterns, that's actually when you stop because you have enough data to start solving. And I think that would be it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank uh, you. What are your questions? If I'm squinting hard enough, I can see the blue hats on everybody's head, so you <laughs> must have some questions. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, then, then I'll start if that's fine okay. with you. Okay. Can you maybe walk us through the first time that you've kind of used the gut feeling as the kind of the research method, like the meta research method uh, when, it, when, it, when it came to a project with a, with a client? I've and you know, NDA and everything, but you know. Yes, yes. I think that I cannot really talk about the first one because I always feel the, this insecurity because of the, the nature of the work itself, you know. But I can tell you about the most recent experience, maybe. Even uh, and it, it's like an organizational research project. And we actually used the second method, let's say it like that, mm -hmm. that. Uh, it's a very complex project and it's not for three months research that we got. Uh, and what we said, we need to deliver something. So we really stopped midway and we tried to work with the data that we had, like the triangle, right? So we made sense out of the data that it's not a circle, it's a triangle. And that was enough. And from actually from the research outcome, it turned out that sometimes when you have so, such a complex problem, you need to just divide it, you know, okay. and then present it in a way that you need extra additional effort to tackle the different topics and the core problem you still are uh, solving it and you're kind of directed into it but you just put the other things aside so you don't get you know confused into the progress in the topic so so divide and conquer of sorts yeah, yeah or try that okay yeah cool uh, and the other thing that i was wondering what's the so you've talked in the kind of the last part of your uh, lecture you talked a lot about the stakeholder buy-in. Mm -hmm. What's the hardest thing? You know, what's the what's the biggest obstacle that you usually face? Uh, maybe no, it's not really related to pitching the idea, but <laughs> kind of to uh, get to keep the attention up because mm -hmm. you have limited amount of time. You need to do it in a way that is understandable for such an audience. Usually, they they think in other like if now in my head is always C positions, for example, mm -hmm. they think in other words and especially numbers. Like for me, it's really hard also sometimes to extract numbers. Like what will be the value out of it, of the research that you do? And they always think in terms of numbers, but you don't have the numbers <laughs> at this point. So maybe that's the most tricky part, I would mm -hmm. say. Okay. Yeah. Why, why uh, don't you just make up a number and then research yeah, if, it's, <laughs> if, it's, if it's the yeah, right hypothesis? That's, yeah, yeah that's this, might be, this might be a good way to go. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. cool. Uh, do we now have any questions? And you can ask in Macedonian, of course. Don't uh, be shy. Don't be on. shy, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, so what happens if you have OKRs you need to follow and you need to validate it by the description of those, or I don't know, but by the OKRs you need to. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I'll just, mm -hmm. sorry, go on. For example, uh, you have an OKR to validate some interface, whatever, and you need to follow some numbers. Do you step away from that? sometimes it feels like you're swimming in mud, for example, and uh, uh, you need to step away from those OPRs and validate with some different numbers. What happens then? Do you have any experience with that? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Victoria, can you uh, just repeat the question for the, for the mic? So the question ah, is... Okay, so, so yeah. the question is... In summary, the question In was, summary, yeah. okay. <laughs> swimming so in the mud. The question is like how you can handle OKRs with this concept. So for example, you have one OKR you need to follow in order to validate whatever. Okay. You have some methodologies in order to validate and like an mm -hmm. interface or like a complex interface, like a data heavy mm. interface or whatever. You have an OKR. Do you step away from that OKR? Uh, when you when you see yourself swimming in mud, or do you follow the OKR just by yourself? Like you never follow the OKR. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you that in this, in the last research project, I'll say I, I need to repeat the question, but it's really hard for me to repeat yeah, the same yeah. question. It's a multifaceted question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a multifaceted yeah, go on, one. Go on, yeah. No problem. In the last project that I talked about, actually I'm acting also as a PO and I was responsible in creating the OKRs and the thing with OKRs is never really to s blindly follow them. So actually they're like, like the objective is really broad. It's really something nice that you want to achieve, but ultimately should be subjected to change. And that's the point with OKRs. If they work or don't, they don't work. You should probably adjust them in the next iteration and next phase. I don't see them ultimately as something that you would need to blindly you know, follow, but really just adjust it. And of course, if you come to a case where you cannot validate it, probably 
that's very crucial thing as an insight. Probably you need some, some different approach. Maybe the OKR is not the right one. So it tells a lot, but I, yeah, probably I would skip the, OK, the objective, <laughs> the OKR. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. This was not a planted question. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. As, as you can see. Okay. <laughs> Incoming. Okay, so, like, this is a really close topic to me because now we have to validate our main objective uh, also to get the next investment for the next phase of the product that I've just mentioned. And I don't think I have a very clear answer to that, but maybe what I would do actually, what I need to do actually, <laughs> is uh, to deliver some parts of it. Not fully, but deliver some parts of it, so we can actually make sense of why you have come to that, uh, like why it was defined as such, but then also leave a bit of space and say that this should be adjusted because, it, because it's not really the case that this is the result out of this subject out of this objective that's a great, that's a great answer mm -hmm. okay <laughs> yeah. and i have a follow-up question to your question so are you more concerned about the o or the kr Sorry. are you more concerned about the o the objective or or the or the kr you know well, the way I'm it's measured about the whole process of delivering things <laughs> okay yeah and like working with research brings a lot of uncertainty and it, you need to kind of make sense of that uncertainty and learn how to work with it. And part of it, like it's always with OKRs, like before they were called, not really, but I don't know, like KPIs in the, in the past. Now, o okay, let's call them OKRs, but it's just the thing that we never should be kind of sticking out to, to them like blindly or blindly, you know, just that for us to be the, the guidance. And in my case, uh, we had like four OKRs, objectives defined, I think that we will be fulfilling just one. And I will still need to think of how we justify that, but probably I will use my own answer here. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that she's smiling nervously. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only one we'll be delivering. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, thank you for a great question. Uh, do we Thanks. have any, any, any more questions? Any, 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 any more VCs, VC, VC managers thinking about <laughs> the startups? I have one. Sure, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Essentially, you could say, you know, that feeling about when you, you're doing enough research, but uh, can you talk about more about, you know, bias and how you deal with it in mm. research and also like how to stay away from it, how to know when it's bias, how do you detect it, if you can give us some mm. examples. Ultimately, how you tackle bias is by having a process and a good design of your research like you need to be aware of you have a starting uh, point right and you need to be aware of what you want to achieve and to detect the right tools methodologies that you need in order to get there and ultimately you need to trust that the community has provided sufficient methods that you can use that will help you not get too much of your bias into the data uh, it's always tricky like I don't know. You can hear that you need at, uh, up to five users, you know, to test. So and then you get I don't know uh, eighty or ninety percent of the uh, of the correct data. But it's not always the case like that, right? Sometimes you need to do more. Um, I don't have like a very perfect formula for that as well as you can see. But it always helps if you're not doing it or on your own. Like it really helped me. Like if I do it with someone else, or at least if I consult or actually if i have a good design research which i follow you know so because i have designed that research in a way that i wouldn't create too much biases right that's ultimately the idea but i th i mean i completely understand you and i think that biases is completely another topic like it really deserves attention yeah. and you can hold a talk the next yeah. time <laughs> around biases and the and the gut feeling and the difference between these two uh, i have a one one question more mm -hmm. uh, victoria so you said to be mindful of the words. So you've used patterns and emerging patterns. How mm -hmm. do we differentiate the two of those? How do you differentiate them, actually? Mm, like, 
that's the part where you try to make sense out of the data. So there's the thing, like there is no like strict border be between all of this, like a line between all of these things, like they're kind of working together, your mental map, trying to find out in between, or I don't know, uh, you stop midway, you know, so all of these techniques are just working on their own in your favor. Mm -hmm. So basically, the emergence of patterns is when you try to make sense of the data and then afterwards you just see patterns, but you're not really sure like whether that's the pattern that you actually is solving your problem. Mm -hmm. So either you continue just researching, like instead of circles, you figure out <laughs> it's a triangle, right? Or I don't know, something else. So yeah, but more or less it's the same thing. They're just overlapping mm -hmm. like, like that. So it's gut feeling. Yeah, once it's again. a gut feeling. Okay. Of okay. So that's the <laughs> motto of this presentation. Cool. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have a, have a question? Okay. Then uh, once again, big big applause for Victoria. Thank you very much. Thank you.